Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and I am excited to be here with my friend Heidi K. Begay. And it was really cool because actually I was on her podcast first, so I feel like we know each other even better before we're doing this interview, which is fun. But also her podcast was all about me and my journey, and I get to learn about her. So this is going to be a really great podcast because we're not only going to be talking about like her journey and how she started making money through from music, but also some side income streams that we we haven't talked about much here on the podcast, talking about podcasting and how that can bring in some income for you, as well as corporate sponsorships. Now, of course, you guys know I've been podcasting for almost 10 years now, so I am all about how can we use a podcast to, to increase our income streams and increase our visibility, but it probably seems a little daunting to some of you, so I think Heidi is going gonna, is gonna to dispel some myths about it and make you feel a little more comfortable about how maybe you could actually add this to your portfolio of things that you're doing to promote you, your music, your teaching, whatever you're doing to to make money in music. So we will jump into that in a second, but I would love to get your backstory, Heidi. Like, how did you get started in music? I know you were a flautist. How did you get started in that? What made you decide to continue on with that as a career and then start helping other flute players? Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for having me. It's so great to see your beautiful shining face. And I love that introduction to your list listeners about their portfolio and bringing in those different income streams. So I can't wait to talk about podcasting and corporate sponsorships, and I can't wait to learn from you today as well. So it's going to be a fun talk. But yeah, real quick backstory. My name is Heidi, and I'm I'm originally from Chicago, and I'm the eldest of three. Love of art actually was in ballet, and I had a very fruitful ballet career, and around 13, 14, I had to stop because I had an injury. I fractured my L5 vertebrae. And therefore, yeah, it's like, okay, well, this is not an option anymore for me and my body. So what else am I going to pour my heart emotions and what's going to be my creative outlet? And so music naturally was there because I was taking piano lessons as I was also a ballerina. And so flute kind of found me at that stage in life and I was hooked. And at 13, I started going to like flute camps in the summertime. I started building up, you know, my mentors in my orbit and I realized this is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And so at 13, I said, someday I'm going to be Dr. Heidi because there was a really pivotal woman in my life who her name is Dr. Diane Boyd Schultz. And she just exemplified so much grace and poise and intelligence and elegance on the stage as a teacher and as a performer. And I remember pointing to that and saying, I want to be that someday. So because of that, from 13, then it was the next 20 years, it was my journey to become Dr. Heidi. And so I did the bachelor's, master's doctorate. And then during that time, I had built up studios. And we can talk about this element more of the business side of things, but I had built up a studio. Um, And then after I graduated with my doctorate in 2018, there were a few rock years from 18 to 20 trying to figure out where I fit into the music industry, what was my voice, how I was going to serve my people. And then in 2020, I really discovered that my podcast, Flute360, was my digital baby. And this is how I was going to serve my community even further, which brings us here today talking about podcasting and at this portfolio career for your listeners. But that's a little bit of my backstory. I don't want to go into the different rabbit holes of like struggles and building up that portfolio career just yet because I don't want to like lose the listener and all and all the madness. Yeah, no, I think we'll probably dip into those as we're talking about other things. But I was curious what you suggested for people that are in school like that for a long time. You built up your studio while you were in school. Was that in order to help pay for it? Like, did you feel like it was 
was way overwhelming to run a studio and be in school at the same time? That's a really good question. And to clarify, I kind of was smushing those years together just to bring everything into a nutshell so I didn't ramble, but now I can kind of clarify. So for my bachelor's and my master's, I taught very sparingly, a few lessons here or there. I had assistantships, but I really built out a massive flute studio actually from 2009 to 2015 in the Fort Worth area. And I was not in school during that time. So I graduated mm. with my master's in 09. And then I went to Fort Worth, Texas, built up a studio of up to 50 to 60 flute students. Mm. Woo. Yes. Like, were you Talk teaching them all yourself or did you have people helping? It was me. Wow. It was me. It was from seven. And then I was teaching adjunct at the community college in downtown Fort Worth at TCC. I was also doing nonprofit work for the Texas Flute Society. And so it was long days. It was like 7 a.m. to 10 p.m every day, Monday through Saturday. It was insane, Brie. And at some point I realized like, I love this. I love teaching. I see myself as an educator. I'm really good at this, but this is not sustainable. Like I can't scale my time. I love my students, but I'm going to work smarter, not harder. And so in 2015, I started my doctorate because the idea was if I get that DMA, then I would have a better chance of locking in one of those full-time tenure track flute professor positions at some point and life had other plans and we can talk about that later but no to answer your question I literally built up my studio of 60 flute students in 09 to 15 purely as a businesswoman I, I was not taking or I was not a student at that time mm. well that makes sense because that's a huge studio and there's no way you could do that at the same time but it's also cool you got all those skills in order to build that thing and build that business but then you got to that point where you were like oh boy this isn't scalable unless I bring in other people and you know maybe I need to look at some other way that I can take all these skills that I've built up from learning plus all that experience of teaching for those six years and maybe make it so that you know it's not sucking your time so much and you're able to be more like a one-to-many kind of thing mm. and yeah and like you said you know so my husband also has a doctorate he's an English professor and oh. um yeah and so I've been through that whole like getting your doctorate thing is no joke no it's not and you know honestly like for me and where I was in my life like I started my doctorate at 30 and at that point I think my husband and I were married for that would have been 2015 so we were married substantially for, for about a good 12 years or so give or take and maybe even 10 and so we as a couple were established and I bring that up because that relationship was so crucial for me to feel emotionally and financially stable as he was supporting me through that degree I could not have done that alone and you know we didn't have a mortgage yet we didn't have kids. And so there were a lot of ingredients to this equation that allowed me to really focus in on that DMA and be kind of selfish for three years and really soak up that time to learn more. Um, so that way, you know, post DMA, I could be that much better of a teacher for my community. Yep. No, I mean, same thing. I was supporting my husband. We got yeah. married right before he started his doctoral program, which was master's and doctorate all together. So it was five years. Wow. And, you know, I was working in finance and that was when I worked at the opera as director of finance and all that stuff while he was getting his doctorate. And so I definitely know it's, they, you really need to be able to focus when you're doing yeah. it. Yeah. So after you got your doctorate, did you pursue, you know, positions, tenure track positions and stuff? Or did you, is that when you were like, hmm, maybe I want to work online or how did that kind of go? Yeah, great question. So I have to back up one step in order for my answer to make sense. And that was, you know, an I'm a believer and so God, you know, works in mysterious ways. At the end of the doctorate, my dissertation was actually my Flute 360 podcast. Oh my gosh. And that's so cool. So in order to appease the degree, my committee said, if you were to build out a website, build out a podcast, make it this really nice digital package. And if you were to produce the trailer plus eight episodes, that would suffice for the degree. So I got to check off that box. You know, it was a great ends to a, or means to an end for the actual doctoral degree. And then post degree in that summer of 2018, I was like, oh, I really like this. This is really fun. And I just kept it going. And then at some point around episode 30, 40, about six months later, I was like, well, if I'm doing this as I'm seeking out for that tenure track flute professor job, let me be smart about this and work smarter, not harder. I want to kill two birds with one stone. And that was 
it's no longer a dissertation in my mind's eye. I'm not going to treat it that way. Now it's no longer this summer hobby project, but now it's going to be a resume builder because in our CVs as musicians, some main categories that we have are creative work and publications. So I thought, great, like the podcast can suffice those two categories. And surely there's going to be a committee out there who's going to go, oh, wow, this is really cool work. You're hired. It's going to be that uh, easy, uh, right? The academic com oh. community was that forward thinking. I Yes. Ooh, that is a very good, yes, very good observation. And so from 2018 to 2019, I was applying to everything under the sun, Brie, while I was teaching. I was applying to adjunct flute positions, um, adjunct just music business positions, full-time positions. And the thing of it is, is nobody really kind of tells you this when you're in school, but you soon find out that this is the case. Once in a blue moon, a full-time flutes professor position is actually announced right and when it is announced there are hundreds of thousands it almost feels that way hundreds of thousands of flutists who are all qualified applying for that one job so i did that relentlessly for two years free and it, to be very very honest and vulnerable it was the it was the two hardest years of my life it sucked me emotionally physically and mentally on so many different levels i wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. It was oh, yeah. so I remember draining. my husband's job market years. It's not fun. I mean, he was it's on the job fun. market before he got his doctorate, like, you know, pre-dissertation. And then after he was done, he had a postdoc. So he had another year to like find a position, but it was like mm. stressful. And it's like, and then it's like, well, it could be anywhere in the country, right? Yes. So then you have to yeah. think about, well, you got to up and move to wherever this place is. And, you know, he got offers from like Oklahoma, which we ended up turning down because we didn't want to move to Oklahoma. What's no, in Oklahoma? No, just in Oklahoma, but like, <laughs> yeah, I just, I, it was so <laughs> different from Southern California. I just couldn't imagine it. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And I'm so glad you brought that up because that is the reality. So after two years of searching relentlessly, I was actually then offered a full-time job outside of Shanghai, China in a oh. town called Tongzong. And kid you not, Breen, like what your husband did, like location, no, what's location? I'm willing to take anything and everything, right? Like if you want me to move to Alaska, I'll move to Alaska. Bree, I was so desperate. Yes, it was a great job and it had a great package, but I was so desperate to say yes to something that I was willing to move halfway across the world away from my husband because he was a remote business owner. And think of China and their restrictions on the internet. Yeah. See, and I was like, well, it's a two year contract. It's a five year contract. We could see each other for a couple wow. years during winter break and summer break. We'll make it work because in my mind, Brie, I had worked 20 years to get that mm -hmm. doctorate. And my identity was wrapped up in being a flutist and a flute professor so much so that I was willing to drop everything and move anywhere at any given moment, like back, you know, to your husband and to his story. But right as I was finishing up my work visa, the pandemic hit and bye bye job. <laughs> saved you in a way, right? It did. It really did. It did. And so that was the moment to answer your question. That was the defining moment. I was going to go back because I'm a stubborn horse. I will just keep at it. And my husband lovingly pulled me over here and was like, Heidi, now let's think about this. Let's be really smart about this. And he was the one who really encouraged me to pivot. And he said, you've had this podcast going on in the background from 2018 to 2020. You have 100 good episodes. Episodes, instead of it being a resume builder, why can't it be your business? Why can't it be your marketing arm that's shining a light onto who you are, what makes you you, and how you can serve your people? And so I had this aha moment of, oh my gosh, you're right. I have a Flute 360 community right there alongside me in my orbit. I can pivot and actually start thinking businessly and bring in those, uh, bringing in those different income streams in and out of my portfolio career to have a sustainable sustainable financial plan and to have and to be financially and creatively fulfilled. And so that was my aha moment. I said, okay, I'm all in. Let's do it. Oh, your husband is super smart. I mean, he is a yes, remote business he... owner, so of course he is. But I'm curious, like at that point, like how big was your community that your podcast had drawn in? How were you connecting with them? Were you connecting with them on social media? Did you have an email list? I think people that are listening might think like, yeah, that's great. And 100 episodes is a lot. Let me just say it's a lot. But like, how do you know when you've 
built something that can actually turn into income. Yes. This is like the question of the hour. And if mm -hmm. there's nothing else that anybody learns from me during this time, this is it. I'm bold, italicizing, highlighting this nugget right here and right now. It, I came to a realization that this sounds really doinky of me, but hear me out. You're gonna be like, Heidi, did you ever go to school? So here was my realization. If you plant corn, you will get corn. If you plant wheat, you will get wheat. But if you plant corn, you will not get wheat. And what I mean by that is I was banging my head against the wall for so long when I was starting to do that pivot, Bree. You're right, like 100 episodes is a big deal. But if you're not sitting from the seat of a CEO business person, you're not going to reap the fruits that you want to see. So my head banging was as I was pivoting, I was still doing Flu360 like I had been for two years, but I wasn't seeing the ROI that I wanted, that I knew that I deserved because you know as a woman pop podcaster one podcast episode take some blood sweat and tears if you want to do it well and so i was like i'm putting in all this time and energy into one show and i'm not really seeing the fruits of my labor and that was my aha moment i was still treating it like corn like a hobby like a resume builder but i was wanting wheat which was mm -hmm. business results. And so literally that is your coaching tip of the hour. It's if you want that business result, if you want to see that ROI and several different income streams coming in and out of your podcast, your business, whatever, you have to sit in the seat of a CEO because then your steps from step zero one to your end result is gonna look much, much different than if you were treating that as a hobby. Oh yeah. Absolutely. And that's true about anything that we do in music, you know, performing even, mm. right? If you treat it like a hobby, you're going to get like tips and, you know, the people saying to you, you know, oh, we'll let you play for exposure, you know, stuff like that, yeah. Ooh, right? Yeah. Instead of thinking about it like a business owner. So what did it look like to transform what you were doing from corn into wheat? Ooh, good question. <laughs> Here's your coaching tip number two for the hour. I guess before when I was a hobby podcaster, I was showing up which is good. I was very consistent and that's a very good, admirable trait to have. Yeah, which is always like the first hurdle yeah, for podcasting. Yeah. Most people pod fade after four episodes. Yeah, they do. Because it's hard work, you know, it oh. is fun, but it is work. And so, yeah, so I was consistent. I was showing up, but I wasn't creating the biggest thing. There are, there are many different factors to this, but the one thing that I will really focus on right here and right now is the content. The content has to be be and speak to your listener. If you're not going through deep dives and really listening to your listener in the sense of like, where are you on your musical journey? What are your hurdles? What are your pain points? That is crucial to the success of your podcast actually generating income. Because before I was showing up consistently creating content, but it was content that interested me. Mm -hmm. It was content that I thought, oh, this is cool for the community. And it really looked, Brie, like a glorified flute magazine, but through a podcast. It was very academic. It was very, and of course, for the last 20 years, I was trained up to be an academic. So, you know, no fault of my own. I can't blame me. That was just my training. I was treating it like this glorified dissertation. Again, great contribution to the community. But what I found to be true is that's not going to convert. Your listeners need to feel like they are seen, they are heard, and they have to know, like, and trust you at a very deep level. And if that's not there, then they aren't going to enroll into your different product services and offerings. Yeah, no, definitely. So I'm assuming that when you started monetizing, you started with your own products. You weren't getting sponsors and things like that. Your goal was to get people to do coaching with you or, you know, be part of your flute studio or, you know, whatever that is, which is what you were saying about people absolutely need to know, like, and trust you and know that you really understand their ups and downs and all that stuff. You've been there. Like, that is so important to them. So what did you start offering first? And what kind of calls to action were you offering? Because like another issue is that people are like delivering the content, but then they don't like ask them to do anything. And they're like, well, why aren't I making any income? Yeah, well, actually, you wouldn't be wrong in coming to that assumption of like, oh, it's gonna be Heidi's own services. Mm -hmm. But I did things backwards. My mm. actual first and this was pre pivot. This was kind of like, where am I going with this? 
And the head banging part was my mind actually, because I was in podcasting academic world, I knew I was bringing on big guests and big names. So before I was even thinking that Flute 360 could really be truly, truly highlighting me and how I can serve my people, my first thought was if I had these huge names coming into my show, I should be monetizing through corporate sponsorships. Mm. So actually my very first income stream was through corporate sponsorships. And then a year later, it was my own services, which was really interesting. And here's another huge tip because I was in that academic podcasting world, I was doing all of the interview all of the interviews within the flutes community right i was emailing i was interviewing composers and performers and orchestral musicians any type of flutist that you can think of i was interviewing them the problem is and that's why i could get corporate sponsors because these businesses were like "Ooh, that's a huge name yes of course you're going to get great traffic and that's going to be good for my ad read but then here was another pivot what i found to be true is doing that for so long and literally i am so thankful. I, my disclaimer is I am beyond thankful for any company who's ever invested me, invested in me. But the issue is when you start to go advertising your own products, services, and offerings, and you're still only interviewing big names in the community, people don't buy because they saw me as a glorified Oprah Winfrey in the flute mm. community when I was doing so then once I realized oh when people are coming through and buying a flute lesson or a master class or something how are they finding me and what gets them to say yes I want to work one on one with her it was solo episodes mm -hmm. isn't that crazy yeah it makes sense it makes mm -hmm. sense. But so in, then is there like a perfect mix of getting these bigger names? So people see you, you know, maybe they are posting on their social media or people just see, oh my gosh, I can't believe this person is on the show. I want to listen versus solo episodes. I mix it up. Yeah. I try to really mix it up, you know, going into July and August for the next like two, three months, probably July through September of this year, I'm gonna be focusing on solo for the next 12 episodes. And then I'll probably go back to, you know, showcasing my guests for some time. And so I think that alternation is it's healthy. One, I love my guests, like to be super clear, I love bringing people onto my show because I get to make a new friend. I get to build a relationship with possibly a new colleague or partner. I get to learn from them. And then I get to tap into their audience and make new friends within their circle. So I'm not like dissing the guests or sponsorships or anything like that. It's just, if you wanted that portfolio career to have different income streams, like your own product services and offerings, sponsorships, affiliate links, you have to do a good mix of interviews and solo episodes. Yeah, I agree. So at this point, are you mostly only advertising your own services? Or do you have corporate sponsorships? Do you find that that like doing it this way still attracts corporate sponsorship? Very good question. So right now I am doing both. But in order to not have too many businesses flooding the content, because I want their ads to convert. Right. And if there's too many ads, then it's going to get really busy. So for this year, and this was the first time I've ever done this, and I'm really excited. I decided to have an onboard one exclusive sponsor for 2023. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that way it was really consistent. I can mix up um, Carolyn Nesbaum's ads for her. She's a flute shop in Plano. We could change the placement, you know, mid-roll, pre-roll, post-roll, different voices, different ad copy. And then her link is consistently the one link that's seen as number one sponsor for flute 360 in all the show notes mm -hmm. and then when i do a marketing blast saying hey new episode she's tagged into it and so it really is a good relationship and partnership where I can fully support her going into those 50 episodes for the year and she can fully support me. And it feels really good to be in this place of like having longevity in a partnership. Yeah, no, that's really cool. Now she's a local business. I think people might be thinking, well, can local businesses really succeed on a podcast? Because aren't most of your listeners like across the world? Yeah. That's a great question. Actually, she, before she even started partnering, partnering with Flute360, man, she does have a name in the international flute world. Mm, she okay. does really well for herself. So yes, it is a local business and she is a small business, but she is at every flute fair, trade show, conference at the regional, national and international levels, like 
religiously. She is a powerhouse. That makes sense. Yeah. So as we wrap up the conversation about corporate sponsors, I think people would love to know, like, how do you get that first one? Like, I know, you know, once you have one, it's much easier to be like, oh, you know, I've been promoting this on my podcast and they've gotten this many sales or whatever. Because, you know, like, for example, I, I promote Vanzoogle a lot on my podcasts and you know cool. and I can say well you know we've had this many signups from it because I know exactly how many we have but nice. how do you get that first one yeah that's a great question man I'm so glad you have a podcast and you're doing what you're doing because you're such a good conversationalist yes I sound like I'm giving you a blanketed answer I'm not answering the question but I really truly am you just ask you <laughs> really you seriously you have to put yourself out there and just ask and the, my podcasting clients through Red House Productions, this is their biggest hang up. They're always like, well, what do I do? And they overthink it. And I get it as a flutist. Like I'm very type A. I'm very much like I got to cross my T's and dot my I's. I totally get it. But action, you will find that clarity in the action. If you take the action, you're putting that out into the universe. You're putting that out in there and it's going to start gaining momentum. Right. And so a lot of times, and that's why I say just ask, because we can get inside of our heads way too much and overthink and, and really kind of like break down and overanalyze these hypothetical situations or conversations. And we're like, oh, they won't say yes. And why would they even bother talking, you know, to me? And we come up with all of these misconceptions or myths, and a lot of them are false. They're not true. And if you just kind of put yourself out there and just kind of rip off the band-aid and just start asking. Um, the right people, of course, then you're going to get that clarity and you're going to start boosting your confidence as well. Yeah. I mean, that's very true. That's what I say to artists when I tell them to go out and get sponsors for their release party locally. Ooh. And, you know, just the idea of walking into a flower shop and saying like, you know, hey, I have this release coming up. Like, I'd love to feature your flowers. You know, it's like cool. super weird and uncomfortable for the first time. But once you get that first person, you're like, you've got that confidence, you know, yes. you yep. know, and I think another way is too, you could start with affiliate products where you don't necessarily even have to ask or you, you know, you could approach them and ask, but it's like a lot lower level ask of saying like, hey, you know, can I get a coupon for my mm. people and also get this percentage and then it's like no skin off their nose if you don't get any people because it's only you only you know they only pay if if you get paid and that kind of thing so that could be like a start and then yeah. you could show from that oh well you know i made this many sales for this company boom right there that was your golden huge tip <laughs> from Bree. that <laughs> literally was amazing yes i teach that all the time yeah i mean i think for me what happened is i did that in podcasting for a few years. And then when I went to do my summits, then I had the confidence to be able to approach for real sponsors for summits where they actually handed me money and I could use it to, you know, promote the summit and stuff. So yeah, just having some kind of track record. And let me tell you guys, they are going to want to know analytics, but yep. don't feel like, well, I have to have a show that, you know, has 10,000 downloads a month or whatever to even start approaching anyone. You don't, it's just, are the people that you attract the exact people that would be interested in this particular product or service? Boom, yep, exactly. My first sponsor, I had 500 downloads a month. Mm. That's it, that's it. And that company, thank goodness that they saw the potential of Flute360. They saw the value that I could bring with a warm audience and the branding was on point. Like I had flutists and they like, were hello, you're not going to get pianists or guitar player. Yeah. You're going to yeah. get flute <laughs> players to listen to the show. It's very, very niche. Yes. So you exactly. know that everybody listening is going to be interested in their thing if that's for that type of person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the thing, Brie, I just kind of want to insert this for the listener. And that is remember that who you are reaching out to these businesses, these are real human beings and people on the other side of the phone or the email. Mm -hmm. They are mothers, they are fathers, they are aunts and uncles, they are grandmas and grandpas, they are cat moms, dog moms, like they're just like you and me. And if you treat them that way and you try to find that win-win for both parties to really excel and succeed in that collaboration, the possibilities are endless because that first sponsor, if you can gain that confidence and gain the courage to reach out to said company, the possibilities after that initial partnership are endless. The Haynes Flutes 
makers were my first sponsor. And after that partnership of a month subscription uh, corporate sponsorship that they had opted in for, they were so happy that they said for the upcoming 2019 National Flute Association Flute Festival in Salt Lake uh, City, Utah, they flew me out to share part of their exhibitor booth for this international flute festival and do live podcasting as they sold flutes in the other half of the booth. Exactly. I mean, something similar happened to me. You know, I've been promoting Banzoogle for a long time. And in 2019, when I released my book, they were like, oh my gosh, this is so awesome. We want to buy this many copies. We want to bring you to ASCAP Expo. We want to bring you to Taxi. We want you to speak in on behalf of us because we're a sponsor and then we'll buy all these books and we'll give them away. You know, and it was all because I had developed a relationship with them. If I would have, you know, contacted them out of the blue once I had my book and said, hey, they would have been like, who the heck yeah. are you? You know, <laughs> hey, buy my books and uh, right. buy like lots of boxes, please. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's relationship building. That's what it is. And, you know, we say, you know, in the music world, and probably your listeners have heard this to some degree, I'm sure they have the power of networking. And I don't want you to hear that we're networking and think that it's this like sleazy, outdated thing. It's just building relationships. That's all it is. And Brie nailed it on the head. Because she had that relationship, she could then scale it to other opportunities because that foundation was there. Yep, yep. Absolutely. Okay, so let's pivot into talking about podcasting because my guess is, and I could be wrong, but my guess is that our listeners are thinking, that sounds very cool. You know, I'm used to kind of talking on stage, so maybe I could talk on a podcast, but like, how would this relate to my music career? Like, how would I come up with something that would either relate to my artistic career or my teaching career in music? that would interest enough people that they'd want to listen and then I could eventually monetize it. Yes. Oh man, your questions are so good. And I know I keep saying that, but because I have been a guest on so many podcast shows, I know, like I've seen it all. So bravo to you. Yes, that is a good question. And to do your listeners justice, the first thing that comes to my mind is a Venn diagram. There are hmm. four circles and the first circle is what are these are questions that you're asking yourself as you're trying to figure out everything that Bree just laid out. The first question that you're asking yourself is what are you passionate about? What gets you up in the morning? What's in your heart? What do you have to do? The second question is what are you good at? What skills do you possess? Okay. The third is what can you get paid to do? And the fourth circle is what is missing in the market mm. at the intersection of those four circles. That's where you want to be. Oh my gosh. That's so great. I love that. That's so actionable. Mm -hmm. And I think yep. people and are like, but is there such an intersection? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and there is an Maybe intersection. Like my circles are like over here and they don't even, <laughs> you know, and that's okay. Like you could be multi-passionate about different things. Like I'm a flutist and how many flutists are out there in the world? Hundreds of thousands, if not millions, right? But what makes you unique? And you could even, it's the same concept, it's the same idea, but if you needed to figure out what your unique thumbprint was, that Venn diagram can really help you find you know that intersection another one that's very similar in the crossover the point is the same it's kind of like this funnel it's this upside down cone and the base is at the top and the tip of the funnel is at the bottom and you have the masses of flutists and you have to figure out the goal is to get to the tip of the funnel, how do you become one of one instead of at the base being one of a thousand? Then you go through and you're like, well, I'm female. Okay, I'm married. I'm married to a Native American man. I've done Native American flute research. I have a podcast. I have a podcasting company. And then you keep going down to figure out like, what makes you unique in your community? And so I'm using the example of flutes because I'm a flutist. And then you go all the way down and then you realize like, oh, I have a flutes podcast. Now I'm one of five. Mm. What separates me from the other five flutes podcasters? Well, I have a doctorate. There's two of us. All right. And then there's Katie Massad and Heidi Begay. Now I'm one of two. And I'm pretty sure she's not married to a Native American man or has Native American flute research. So Heidi is one of one and that's empowering. And both of those exercises y'all will only take you five, 10 minutes and you can get so much clarity on that. And you can be like, oh, okay. And then you can get the wheels in motion 
and then start going towards that goal of saying, this is who I am. This is how I'm going to serve the market. And once you get into the weeds of it, then there might be small little pivots along the way. Then you may realize like, oh, I can open up this or I can open up that because that would all kind of still make sense under my branding or I can kind of get rid of this under my product suite. Don't you agree, Brie? Like you start gaining that clarity once you're in it and once you have yourself established, then the rest kind of comes organically. Yeah, definitely for sure. And I, I think about myself, you know, when I started looking at starting my podcast, which was 2015, and I had already been serving females with women of substance. And I was like, okay, I've got like this list of 3000 females, you know, and all these social media where I am attracting female artists, I'm helping them promote their music. And so, you know, it would make sense that I've already got this group of people that I could then help Well, Now, what could I help them with? You know, mm. do I want to help them with you know, writing music, not really. Do I want to help? You know, and so I don't, and then I'm like, well, what do I have that's different? Well, I have a background in finance. Like, are there that many people out there teaching the cross section of music and business? And then I think about my own journey and I was like, yeah, I had a trouble combining music and business, even though I was a music and business major, like mm -hmm. a double major, you know? Yeah. And so I was like, well, if I had problems, well, they must have problems. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's kind of how I came to the idea of like female entrepreneur musicians which was my my first show and thinking like well my biggest thing that I see with them or they're stuck is like they don't think of themselves as entrepreneurs so let's try to yep. you know make our goal teaching them that they are and honestly I mean between 2015 when I started that show and probably 2019 like the idea of women or of female artists being entrepreneurs like now it's just like well of course we are you know what I mean it like became yeah. just an understanding versus like this is my education and it's kind of amazing like I feel like I played a part in that that's cool yeah and the ripple effect it can be huge mm -hmm. yeah no that's amazing yeah I love hearing your journey too and you've obviously kept up with the podcasting world because you're seeing the fruits of your labor and it's connecting you with the people that you need to be connected with as well yeah I mean the podcast was really the gateway to everything. You know, I, I started out as online radio and then we moved that to a podcast, Women of Substance in 2014. And then I started the female entrepreneur musician in 2015 because I knew I was going to move into some kind of coaching and I wanted to oh. be able to serve them. And like that just led to so many things, right? The podcast allowed me to, you know, be seen as an expert in my field. It led me to be able to be asked to be on a lot of other things. And then I did summits, you know, all of that was born really out of podcasting, which is kind of amazing when I think about it, mm, <laughs> you yeah. know, and that, and that podcast, female entrepreneur musician, it is still around because it's been around since 2015. So like we yeah. have a lot of subscribers and listeners that still listen to it. And even though I started a new one, this, you know, the profitable musician show in 2020, because I was like, I really want to serve musicians all across the board who want to make more money. That was the goal with that but like you know there's a cross section of those as well where they fit together but like I can't imagine basically anything that I've done without podcasting yep yep I couldn't agree more the people the opportunities the open doors it's completely changed my career yeah I mean you get so much exposure from it as well so what about the artists like say you know I was kind of thinking with artists like where could they have a niche should they do a music podcast or should they maybe do something? Maybe they've got like a cause that they're really excited about or like something that they do in life that's really interesting. Like maybe they are a home, they're a homesteading family or whatever, you know, like what could an artist do that was not just talking about their music every week? Yeah, I guess that's kind of the 360-ness of my show because it was flute and that's very niche, but I saw that how I operate as a person in this world, as a teacher, as a performer, my hobbies, my family, my friends, you know, the things that take my interest, like what you're saying, it kind of all comes together. There's, I can't compartmentalize my life. Mm -hmm. So even though, so the answer is in the example of Flute360. So even though I'm talking with flutists and musicpreneurs like you and really looking at the flutist holistically, we look at these three facets, the human, the artist, and the musicpreneur, because it's all connected. We're looking at the entire flutist because if you aren't taking care of yourself well, mm -hmm. right, then you're not going to be able to make money or play your instrument well, and then vice versa. But so to 
answer your question, things that interest me and things that I have a passion for outside of flute easily come into my show when I get to talk about the human because I'm really passionate about health. I love how food plays a huge part in how we function in this world, right? And so I get to look at that and bring that passion through Food 360, even though it's not a health show. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I think, you know, what a lot of people get afraid of is like, oh, getting so niche or getting in this niche and not bringing the other elements. You know, of course you don't want to confuse your listener. You don't want to be talking about like Korean barbecue and then... (laughs) And then, you know, your, your songwriting the next day, but you know, these different things that make you, you as a musician, as the songwriter, these qualifying themes, like, oh, you, if you love Korean barbecue, or if you are one of seven kids, or do you know what I mean? Like that Mm -hmm. can come up naturally in your branding and your messaging. It, it, it forms your unique perspective of the world, not another songwriter in the world will be one of seven kids and love Korean barbecue. I don't know. I I don't want to confuse anyone. I hope that resonates with you and you agree with that. But yeah, I'll I'll put that to bed and you let me know if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it definitely makes sense. And I think, you know, first of all, story is always going to be so compelling. So sometimes people are interested in whatever story you're telling because they resonate with it because they're like, oh my gosh, I totally remember when that happened to me in high school or whatever. And then sometimes it's because your experience is so different from theirs that they're totally intrigued by it. Yes. Right. So there's kind of two directions with that. But I think, I think the thing that might get people tripped up is, are they looking at their podcast from what audience do I want to attract? Like who am I speaking to or what subject matter am I covering? Because they're a little bit different. Mm. Well, I think this is a good slash challenging question. So I hope mm. I, again, do it service. But I, my gut says in my answer, it would be a follow-up question to the listener. And that is, what result do you want from your podcast? Reverse engineer it. If you could have your cake and eat it too, right? Your ROI and it doesn't have to be finances or whatever, whatever your goal is, what's your end goal? What is in your mind's eye of what that is? Then you have to reverse engineer that and then go back, say that's, you know, the outcome. You have to reverse engineer it, go seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and figure out then what your starting point, where your starting point is. Does that make sense? Because if you are wanting to the first proposition or the first option that you gave me was, am I, creating content to bring people in like you know for people to serve for me to serve people correct Mm -hmm. then the content has to reflect that yeah no sense yes no I think that's a very good answer and I think if I think about the examples of my podcast and my friend's podcast a lot of time the title of the podcast is like aspirational you know female entrepreneur musician right like I want to be that or profitable musician. I want to be that. Or like my friend Tara's podcast, the engaging voice, like she teaches them to have an engaging voice. And, Hmm. you know, her goal is to get students for her, you know, for her voice studio and, you know, any courses that she's teaching, that kind of thing. So yeah, thinking about what you want them to do, what action you want them to take. And then, like she said, reverse engineer that. And then what do they want? You know, Mm -hmm. what is their aspiration? Oh, they want to be a profitable musician. Mm -hmm. Or in the case of Flute 360, like the idea is like, I mean, you can tell me what the idea is behind that name. But like, to me, it says like, like flute, like everything I ever wanted to know about being a flutist and like, that is my passion. That is my life. Like I am living that, you know, Mm -hmm. full circle. Right. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So, and you know, And then your other option to that question was, you know, the academic, I believe. Am I saying that correctly? You know, and obviously just my disclaimer is like, I'm not always selling through my podcast. I'm not always going, oh, if that's your end result, like, buy for me, buy for me. (laughs) Right, right. There, There is academic content and I need to build up those relationships because I really do care and I really want to bring my listeners value. So there is that healthy balance. Yeah, exactly. And I know for me, I'm like the first thing I asked anyone that says they want to be on my show is that like, what do you have? This is, we had this conversation, you know, what can you talk about that we haven't talked about lately? Yep. That like is unique. That's going to really interest our people that we haven't already covered. Boom. 
Yep, and so you're exactly. always thinking about your, your user, you know, and also me, like I'm super curious about as, as I, even though I built my, my, you know, everything around a podcast, like I don't teach people to do that. So I haven't necessarily thought through all the, all the intricacies of how I did it. I just did it. Yeah, exactly. Yep. You know? Yeah, definitely. Wow. This has been such a great conversation. I feel like we could e even talk further on this, but I do have to cut us off, but I would love for you to tell everybody how they can find you online, on social media, your website, all the things. Oh, thank you so much. Well, thank you again for having me. And I love learning from you, Bree. And I just love seeing this relationships, you know, starting to blossom, but yeah, so I have two companies. One is Flute360 and that's what we've been talking about with my podcasting world as a flute everything my handle there is at Heidi K Begay so you can find me through Facebook LinkedIn Twitter Instagram my website there is Heidi K Begay.com for anything flute 360 and flute related and then for the podcasting side of things that is Red House Productions and you can find us through redhouseproductions.net if you're more interested in the podcasting world yeah well I can't think of anyone better to help you build a podcast from what I've heard today than Heidi so if you're a musician and you're thinking this could be you know an addition to your portfolio of ways that you connect with other people, then definitely reach out to her at redhouseproductions.net. Thank you so much, Heidi. Doctor, I got to say that because you worked hard for it. Dr. Heidi K. Begay, thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge and experience with us today. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.